Welcome to the City Current Radio Show. I'm your host, Andrew Bartolotta. Today, we are fortunate to talk to parent mentor, mom to four, founder of three businesses, and international best-selling author, Sue Donnellan. Sue, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Andrew. Thank you so much for having me. Give listeners a quick history for your career and family. Yep, you know, married my soulmate, met him in college, never was too sure that I wanted children, but he did. So I thought that it would be very nice of me to give a child to him. <laughs> so we had our firstborn and then we thought, well, he needs a sibling. So on our second go around, I ended up with natural triplets. Um, so mom of four, but even prior to the kids, I had started my own business. And in the last 25 years, I that's had a, a several offshoots. So I've run my own, my own business, managed a family of six. And uh, yeah, so... That's what I've been doing, juggling quite a few things. <laughs> In your award-winning bestseller book, Secrets to Parenting Without Giving a F, you shared 20 plus years of the effective mindset for successful parenting that you developed raising your four kids. Give listeners a few topics that they can learn from in your book. Sure. Uh, the, the premise of um, my, my method of parenting is it was it originated and sprung from Montessori principles. And really what that is, is just different ways of um, instilling accountability into children and giving them respect. Even though we think we show children respect, there are a multitude of other ways that we could be showing respect. And uh, those basic principles were then evolved into my own, my own initiative of partnership parenting. So in the book, uh, and when I mentor, we talk a lot about partnership and about accountability and that the, the methods that we've been using for years, whether it's punishment or timeouts or some of these knee-jerk reactions that we use, really, they may solve your problem in that moment, but ongoing and long-term, they're not methods that really work. So when I found myself overwhelmed with four kids, when I really wasn't sure I wanted any, um, I had a lot to learn, right? So I was doing the yelling, I was doing all the things that all of us do, and I had a lot to learn into how to motivate and be a leader and a role model to my kids and to how to inspire them to get done what I needed them to get done. So in the introduction of your book, um, it's about how your child is the result of how you parent. And mm -hmm. I love that you're just unapologetically authentic when it comes to sharing advice and stories. What inspired you to become a parent mentor after saying you weren't initially interested in even having kids? Those who have the most to learn, <laughs> I find come become the better teachers because, you know, we, I, ha I have come so far when I think about my mentality of not ever wanting kids was and just just mired in, in the selfishness of our world and our life and you know everything I've really learned about myself and about leadership has come from being a parent uh, and so I, I think that that's really just what you know when we're when we're looking at parenting we tend to think that parenting is about the child and parenting is really about us as the parent and we're told we have to fix the child but in in essence we really uh, no one ever tells us that it's about us and so if I was going to stop yelling and if I was going to get better behavior out of my kids it was going to come from me changing how my child responds to me so that's the the essence of it it's a little it seems a little illogical because we're externally responding that oh you know I need my child to to change or I need, but he's responding to us or to me, right? So that was really why I felt it was important to, to put that in the beginning of the book, because if you're not in, in a place or state of mind of where you're going to be willing to change or understand that if you're taking credit for good kids, you also need to be able to take credit for when they're misbehaving, that they're responding to what you're doing or saying. And sometimes with a, a slight little tweak, we get a better different response. So you talk a lot about capability for children. Um, how can kids at any age discover tasks that can be easily delegated to them? They discover that through our leadership and through our parenting. And so we've got to be able to believe in them. We've got to be able to set the stage in our home that mirrors society. So if we are creating an environment with which they 
make mistakes and learn from them. And we're setting that stage for them to be able to fall down and pick themselves back up or go make themselves happy or whatever supportive environment we can create for them to learn from their mistakes or from lessons. And this can be structured at any age, at any time with any behavioral issues. It's all about understanding the behavior and backing it up and you know kind of working in advance these are a lot of the techniques and methods that i teach for behavioral issues but if you've got a child that you want to be a little bit more independent you know challenge them and ask them questions and get them involved and you would just be amazed over what kids can do and that was one of the things that uh, early on we had our our kids in montessori preschool and I tell a story in the book about how I was just exasperated. I went to one of the parent teacher conferences and I was, oh, you know, oh, yeah, kids, you know, they didn't pick their flavor of juice and I couldn't get out the door. You know, I felt really sorry for myself. And the teacher just looked at me, you know, unemotional and just said, well, why are you still packing their lunch? And I thought they're five, like, why wouldn't I? And she, she gently explained to me all the things that they were doing in the classroom that was, you know, very independent minded and very accountable minded. And uh, I'll tell you what, you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> you know, from that day forward, I set the stage in my home to where they had everything at their eye level. And I just had expectations. I felt more confident in my expectations of what they could could do and wanted to do. And I never looked back. I mean, for, I'm not kidding from day one, four kids made their own lunches uh, happily, willingly, and were kind of find it, found it interesting that even through high school, the kids just throw their mom's lunches away that the mom has worked really hard to prepare. So it's really a state of mind of expectation and training. And these are all things that I talk about that just understanding what your kid is capable of doing and how to train them and how to set your environment in the home with that in mind. I love that. And you're really setting them up for independent success and being able to realize that they can do things that um, that maybe they think that they couldn't do. And then from there, then once they know that they're capable of doing those things, they're able to continue. And I can imagine it's uh, easier on you. I mean, you still have to dice, you know, strawberries up or whatever yeah. and set them aside, but still being able to, to empower them independently to do that allows them to, to feel confident in the gifts that they're able to accomplish. When you set the tone for that and you see how happy it makes them and how much they feel like they're contributing and the decisions they have to make in the process and how that kind of propels them forward. And I feel like the way that we raised the kids and had those expectations made them kind of wise beyond their years. So by the time they got to middle school and, and high school, they were making more informed decisions because they'd been doing so much for themselves. Um, same, we were so empowered by them making their own lunch that they, we bought little pop-up hampers and five, six years old, they've been doing their own laundry and loving it. And, you know, it doesn't matter if they ruin a, a pair of you know pants or a shirt at that age, but they sure did, you know, sit on their little stool, pop their stuff in, put the soap in and, um, had fun doing it. And that was the days of me holding up a shirt and saying, whose shirt is this? You know, well, and all this extra work that I just really didn't have time to do. Yeah. Yeah. Pass that to them. They're happy to do it. And it's a great relief for me. What a great idea. Okay, so let's go from capability to tantrums. Every parent deals with childhood tantrums. Share a few best practices for combining that stop yelling technique with effective reactions to tantrums. Number one, you know, we all we all do have to work with, with tantrums. Every child deals with it. And it's it's kind of a rite of passage, really. It's it's a growth spurt, it's a it's a an awakening, it's it's something that every child does, and it really doesn't mean anything, you know, when we're experiencing it in the moment, if we're not expecting it, we tend to, to make grand, you know, oh my gosh, my child, like our firstborn, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And I'm like, he's just a bad seed. Thank God I've got three more kids coming because I, you know, where, where, where would this kid go off the rails? Right. So, so number one with tantrums, it's, it's the, um, understanding it's coming know it's coming and we don't have to overparent that moment. Okay. That's number one. And number two, the, the tantrums that are taken care of at home with consistency are the tantrums that you never have in public. So if you're taking care of it at home and you're being consistent, you're really not going to be dealing with it out in public. You know, it's, it just kind of goes away. Um, 
Number three, uh, inv invisibility cloak, really. If, if, if you're, if there's no audience, why would I throw the tantrum? You know, you keep yourself busy. You act as if it's not happening. You do not have to overparent that moment. Uh, we can just stay calm because we know that it's coming and we know that it's a rite of passage and it doesn't really mean anything. Now, if it's, you know, there's, there's other methods in terms of escalation, if they're throwing things, hitting these types of things, there's ways to handle that. But in the, for the most general sense of tantrums, we really just don't need to give it time. We can busy ourselves in another room where we can still hear the child, but we're acting like it's not even happening. So what you really want to do is you want to become a, a, a pattern noticer. So it's all about noticing pattern of behavior. If it happens once, you know, we know how to handle it. But if it happens more than once, we see a pattern and we want to start to interrupt it and we want to start to train for it. So it's parenting and my methods are really about parenting in advance, right? So it's it's about looking for the patterns, knowing how to interrupt it and acting in advance. So when we talk about tantrums are one thing, but we're talking about yelling, say, notice that certain behavior might trigger you and that it's causing you to yell. In my case, um, I had a huge playpen for the triplets and my older son always wanted to go in and play. Well, every time he went in, someone cried. That was a power trip for him. So. I, you know, it happens once, happens twice. I notice the pattern. Okay, so it's happening. Now I need to go, how do I interrupt this pattern? And you act in advance. So before he goes into the, to the playpen, I expect the crying to happen at his hand, right? So then I stop and I say, if you go in and you make them cry, what should we do about that? And he then will decide, well, then I have to come out or whatever. He'll decide his consequence. Mm -hmm. All because I've noticed a pattern and I started acting in advance and I get him in on it. Now I'm training. So my expectation is that when you go in there to play that no one cries. So what's going to happen if they do cry? But then he is now the author of his consequence, right? So he goes in, sure enough, somebody cries. Now the old Sue would have gone in and screamed and yelled and you always are making them cry. You tell them that, that, that you know. <laughs> <laughs> because I didn't recognize the pattern and I didn't back it up and act, and act in advance. Now, now that I have used that method, I calmly walk over and say, what did we discuss? Someone's crying. What did you agree to? Now, here's a five-year-old taking accountability, creating his consequence and coming out because he said, well, I agreed that I would come out if I made someone cry. Okay. When you're ready to play without someone crying, you may rejoin them. Now he's in control. I am not issuing a timeout. I'm not dictating how long and for how, you know, however his behavior is creating, um, you know, you need to go upstairs and in two minutes and time, none of that works. So he is the author of the consequence. He is holding himself accountable at my leadership by saying, what did you agree to? And then I'm authoring, you know, I'm offering him the freedom to go back in when he feels ready. And it works. So we're noticing patterns, we're interrupting them, we're acting in advance and taking time for training. It's, it's foolproof. I love that. Those are so many great tips. What Thanks. puts a smile on your face when you look at the work you've been able to accomplish over the past few decades? What really gives me a huge kick? Well, number one is the kids, my kids, that they're all you know 23 and 20 now. And to see them thriving and succe succeeding and happy. And with our parenting methods, um, they've all found their, what gets them out of bed in the morning. They've all found their passion. And that was really kind of a goal of mine to make sure that we march them into the direction of where they want to go to find their, their passion. Um, but I get the biggest kick out of when I'm mentoring parents and they scratch their head and say, well, that seems illogical. Why would I, you know, and it's so kind of counterintuitive then getting a phone call or an email within a day or two, like, well, it worked. Oh my gosh. You know, I can't believe that it worked. Um, it's once you're just made aware of some of these simple techniques, it just creates the partnership. It creates respect and it creates, you know, accountability and independence. So we're all winning. So that makes me happy when that happens. Where can people go to learn more about your mentoring, ask a parenting question and purchase your book? 
Well, they can ask momparenting.com. I've got some free downloads. Um, I offer, you know, for, for your listeners, they've got 20 free minutes. They can sign up with me for 20 free minutes to just kind of find out if this is a fit or, you know, we can even solve a quick problem in that 20 minutes. Uh, askmomparenting.com and my, my book is available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Apple iTunes. Um, so a variety of places that it's sold. Sue, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Andrew.